morning class. Today we're going to do the wind puncture procedure. This will include steps 1 to 20. Step 1. Review and a session test request. But before we go to that, let's talk a bit about vinipuncture. Vinipuncture is the process of collecting or drawing blood from a vein and the most common way to collect blood specimens for laboratory testing. It is the most frequent procedure performed by a phlebotomist and the most important step in this procedure is patient identification. This chapter addresses how to correctly identify all types of patients and how to safely obtain high quality blood specimens from them. Vinipuncture techniques covered in this chapter includes ETS and syringe procedures on arm and hand veins. This chapter also addresses challenges and unique issues associated with pediatric, geriatric, dialysis, long-term care, home care, and hospice patients. So let's start. Step one, review and accession test requests. Blood collection procedures legally begin with a test request. This is the first step for the laboratory in the pre-analytical or before analysis or pre-examination phase of the testing procedure. Typically, a physician or other qualified healthcare professional requests laboratory testing. The exceptions are certain rapid tests that can be purchased and performed at home by consumers and blood specimens requested by law enforcement officials that are used for evidence. The test requisition. The form on which test orders are entered is called a requisition. The requisitions become part of a patient's medical record and require specific information to ensure that the right patient is tested. The physician's orders are met, the correct tests are performed at the proper time under the required condition, and the patient is built properly. Step 2. Approach, identify, and prepare patient. Approaching the patient. Being organized and efficient plays a role in a positive and productive collection experience. Before collecting the specimens, the phlebotomist should arrange the requisitions according to priority and review them to see that needed equipment is on the blood collecting tray or cart before proceeding to the patient's room. Outpatients are typically summoned into the drawing room from the waiting room in order of arrival and check-in. As with inpatients, start requests take priority over all others. Patient identification. The process of verify verifying a patient's identity is the most important step in the specimen collection. Obtaining a specimen from the wrong patient can have serious, even fatal consequences, especially in specimens for type and cross match prior to blood transfusion. Misidentifying a patient or specimen can be grounds for dismissal of the person responsible and can even lead to a malpractice lawsuit against that person. Verifying name and date of birth. The patient must be actively involved in the identification process. When identifying a patient, ask the patient to state his or her full name and date of birth. The patient's response must match the information on the requisition and or computer-generated specimen labels. Any errors or differences must be resolved before a sample is collected. Preparing the patient. Explaining the procedure. Most patients have had a blood test before. A statement of your intent to collect a specimen for a blood test is usually sufficient for them to understand what is about to occur. A patient who has never had a blood test may require a more detailed explanation. 
special procedures may require additional information. If a patient does not speak or understand English, you may have to use sign language or other non-verbal means to, to demonstrate what is to occur. If this fails, an interpreter must be located. Speaking slowly and distinctly, using sign language or writing down information may be necessary for patients with hearing problems. Step four, sanitize hands. Proper hand hygiene plays a major role in preventing the spread of infection and is an important step in the venipuncture procedure that should not be forgotten or performed poorly. Depending on the degree of the contamination, hands can be contaminated by washing or use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers, which are normally available in the form of gels or foam. Step five, position patient, apply tourniquet, and ask patient to make a fist. Positioning the patient. In patients, normally have blood drawn while lying down in their beds. All patients at most facilities are drawn while sitting up in special blood drawing chairs. If a special chair is not available, the patient should be seated in one that is steady and comfortable and has arm rest. In case the patient faints, if a suitable chair is not available, or an outpatient is in a weakened condition or known to have fainting tendency, the blood can be drawn with the patient in a reclining chair or lying on a sofa or bed with all blood drops. Be prepared to react in case the patient feels faint or loses consciousness. Tourniquet application and fist clenching. A tourniquet is applied three to four inches above the intended venipuncture site to restrict venous blood flow and make the veins more prominent. If it is closer to the site, the vein may collapse as blood is removed. If it is too far above the site, it may be ineffective. In drawing blood from a hand vein, the tourniquet is applied proximal to the wrist bone. Step six, select vein, release tourniquet and ask patient to open this. The preferred venipuncture site is the anticubital area of the arm, where a number of veins lie fairly close to the surface. Typically, the most prominent of these are the median cubital, cephalic, and basilic veins. The median cubital median veins are normally closer to the surface, more stationary, and in an area where nerve injury is least likely. Consequently, they are the first choices of venipuncture, followed by cephalic and median cephalic veins. The basilic and median basilic veins are last choice veins because they are near the median nerve and brachial artery, which could be punctured accidentally. So class, the first choice vein will be the median cubital vein, followed by the cephalic vein, and last, the basilic vein. A patient will generally have the most prominent veins in the dominant arm, meaning if they are, they use their dominant hand as their right hand, the prominent veins will be in that hand. If the dominant arm is the left hand, then the dominant veins will be in their left hand. Do not select a vein that feels hard and cord-like or lacks resilience, as it is probably sclerosed or thrombosed. Such veins roll easily or hard to penetrate and may not have adequate blood flow to yield a representative blood sample. Tendons are also hard and lack resilience. Rotating the patient's arm slightly helps to locate veins and different differentiate them from other structures. After you have selected a suitable vein, mentally visualize its location if it is not obvious, making a mental note of the position of the vein 
in reference to landmarks such as, as a freckle, mole, hair, skin crease, superficial surface vein, or imperfection makes relocation easier after the delay, after the delay while the site is cleansed. Do not mark the site with a pen. This contaminates the site and the pen. The pen can become a source of infection transmission if it is used on other patients. An acceptable way to mark the site using an alcohol pad. This of course is done before the site is clean, so the pad must be placed far enough away from the site so it is not disturbed in the cleaning process. If the tourniquet was applied during vein selection, release it and ask the patient to open the fist. This allows the vein to return to normal and minimizes the effects of stasis from blockage of blood flow on specimen composition. Step 7. Clean and air dry the site. The venipuncture site must be cleaned with an antiseptic prior to venipuncture. Otherwise, microorganisms from the skin could be picked up by the needle and carried into the vein, creating the possibility of infection or flushed into the collection tube on blood flow, contaminating the specimens. The recommended antiseptic for cleaning a venipuncture site is 70% isopropyl alcohol, which is typically available in sterile prepackaged pads refer referred to as alcohol prep pads. Clean the site with a circular motion starting at the point where you ex expect to insert the needle and moving outward in ever-widening concentric circles until you have cleaned an area approximately 2 to 3 inches in diameter. Use sufficient pressure to remove surface dirt and debris, but do not rub so vigorously that you abrade the skin, especially on infants and elderly patients whose skin is thin and more delicate if the site is especially dirty. Clean it again with another alcohol prep bag. Allow the area to dry naturally for 30 seconds to 1 minute. Step 8. Prepare equipment and put on gloves. Assemble the components of the blood collection system and supplies if you have not already done so. Choose the collection system, needle size, tube volume according to the age of the patient, size and location of the vein, and the amount of blood to be collected. Select tubes according to the test that have been ordered. Select and attach the needle to the collection device, but do not remove the needle sheath. Cap or cover at this time. Put on a clean pair of gloves if you have not already done so. Step 9. Reapply tourniquet, uncap and inspect needle. Reapply the tourniquet being careful not to touch the cleaned area. Be aware that there are a few tests, that is lactic acid, that must be collected without, without using a tourniquet. Pick up collection equipment with your dominant hand. Both an ETS tube holder and a syringe are held close to the needle hub with the thumb on top and two or three fingers underneath and slide, slightly to the side. Turn your wrist upward slightly so the opening of the tube holder remains accessible. Hold the wing portion of the butterfly between your thumb and index finger or fold the wings upright and grasp them together. Remove the needle cover and visually inspect the needle. Although rare, a needle can have obstructions that could impair blood flow or imperfections such as roughness or barbs that could hurt the patient or damage the vein. If any are noted, discard the needle and select a new one. Step 10. Ask patient to remake a fist, anchor vein, and insert needle. At this time, the patient is asked to again make a fist. The non-dominant hand is used to anchor, secure firmly the vein while the collection equipment is held and the needle inserted using the dominant hand. Anchoring. To anchor anticubital veins, grasp the patient's arm with the free hand using your fingers to support the back of the arm just below the elbow. Place your thumb a minimum of one to two inch below 
and slightly to the side of the intended venipuncture site, pull the skin toward the wrist. This stretches the skin, taut, pull tight or without slap. Anchor the vein and help, and helping to keep it from moving or rolling to the side upon needle entry. If the vein rolls, the needle may slip beside the vein, not into it. In addition, a needle passes through taut skin more easily and with less pain. Even so, it is not uncommon for an apprehensive patient to suddenly pull back the arm as the needle is inserted. Because your fingers are wrapped around the arm, the patient is less likely to pull away from your grasp and the needle is more likely to stay in the vein. This is known as the, uh, the L-hold technique for anchoring the vein. Needle insertion. Hold the collection device in your dominant hand as described in step nine. The bevel of the needle should be facing up. Position the needle above the vein so it is lined up with it, parallel or following its path. Your body should be positioned directly behind the needle so that you are not trying to insert the needle with your arm or hands at an awkward angle. Warn the patient by saying something like, there is going to be a little poke or stick now. For antipubital side venipunctures, insert the needle into the skin at an angle of 30 degrees or less, depending on the depth of the vein. A shallow vein may need an angle closer to 15 degrees, while a deeper vein may require an angle closer to 30 degrees. Use one smooth, steady forward motion to penetrate first the skin and then the vein. Advancing the needle too slow prolongs any discomfort. A rapid jab can result in missing the vein or going all the way through it. When the needle enters the vein, you will feel a slight give or decrease in resistance. Some phlebotomists describe this as a pop, although it may be described as a feeling and not a sound. It is especially important to recognize the decrease in resistance when using an ETS needle and tube holder because most needles do not provide visual confirmation that the vein has been entered. When you sense the pump or recognize the lessening of resistance signaling that the needle is in the vein, stop advancing it and secure, securely anchor the tube holder or syringe by pressing back your fingers or knuckles against the arm. Discontinue anchor with your thumb and let go of the arm with the hand. Step 11. Establish blood flow, release tourniquet, and ask patient to open fist. To establish blood flow, when using the EDS system, the collection tube must be advanced into the tube holder until the stopper is completely penetrated by the needle. This is accomplished most efficiently by pushing the tube with your thumb while your index and middle fingers struggle and grasp the flanges of the tube holder pulling back on them slightly to prevent forward motion of the tube holder. If the vein has been successfully entered, blood will begin to flow into the tube. If you are using a syringe, a flash of blood in the syringe hub indicates that the vein has been successfully entered. Blood flow into the syringe is achieved by slowly pulling back on the plunger with your free hand. Release the tourniquet and ask the patient to release the fist as soon as blood flows freely into the first ETS tube or is established in the syringe. Blood should continue to flow until multiple tubes have been collected or the syringe filled. On elderly patients and others with fragile veins that might collapse or in other difficult draw situations where, release, where release of tourniquet might cause blood flow to stop, the tourniquet is sometimes left on until the last tube is filled. Do not, however, leave the tourniquet on for more than one minute or test results may be affected. Step 12. Fill, remove, and mix tubes in order of draw or fill syringe. Following the order of draw, place ETS tubes in the holder and advance them onto the needle. ETS tubes fill automatically and until the tube vacuum is exhausted or lost. 
A syringe is filled manually by slowly and steadily pulling back on the plunger until the barrel is filled to the appropriate level. Maintain needle position while the tubes or syringe are filling. Try not to pull up, press down, or move the needle back and forth or sideways in the vein. These actions may be painful to the patient and enlarge the hole in the vein, resulting in leakage of blood and hematoma formation. Keep the arm in a downward position so that the blood fills. ETS tubes from the bottom up and does not contact the needle in the tube holder. Under certain conditions, reflux, which is flow of blood from the tube back into the vein and a possible adverse patient reaction from additives can occur if tube blood is in contact with the needle. Additive containing blood on or on in the needle could also contaminate subsequent tubes when multiple tubes are collected. Do not change position of the tube or allow back and forth movement of blood in the tube as this too can cause reflux. A downward arm position also helps maintain blood flow. To ensure a proper ratio of blood to additive, allow ETS tubes to fill until the normal vacuum is exhausted and blood ceases the flow. Tubes do not fill completely to the top. When blood flow stops, remove the tube using a reverse twist and pulling motion while bracing the thumb or index finger against the flange of the holder. The rubber sleeve will cover the needle and prevent leakage of blood into the tube holder. If the tube contains an additive, mix it by gentle in gently inverting it three to eight times depending upon the type of additive and manufacturer's recommendations. As soon as it is removed from the tube holder and before putting it down, lack of delayed or inadequate mixing can lead to clot formation and necessitate recollection of the specimen. Non-additive tubes do not require mixing. When the last ETS tube has been filled, remove it from the holder and mix it if applicable. Before removing the needle from the arm, if the tube is still engaged when the needle is removed from the arm, the needle may drip blood and cause needless contamination. If the tourniquet is still on, release it before removing the needle. If the needle is removed with the tourniquet in place, blood may run down the arm and alarm the patient. Step 30. Place gauze, remove needle, activate safety feature, and apply pressure. After the last tube has been removed from the holder or an adequate amount of blood has been collected, if you are using a syringe, fold a clean gauze square into forks and place it directly over the site where the needle enters the skin. Hold the gauze lightly in place but do not press down on it until the, re the needle is removed. If the needle safety feature is designed to function within the vein, activate it according to the manufacturer's instructions. Withdraw the needle from the vein in one smooth motion. If the needle safety feature operates outside the vein, activate it immediately while simultaneously applying pressure to the side with your free hand. Apply pressure to the side for 3-5 to five minutes or until the bleeding stops. Failure to apply pressure or applying inadequate pressure can result in leakage of blood and hematoma formation. It is acceptable to have the patient hold pressure while you proceed to label tubes or fill them if a syringe was used, provided that the patient is fully alert and able to do so. Do not ask the patient to bend the arm up. The arm should be kept extended or even raised. If the shop's container has been moved out of reach, as sometimes happens in emergencies when others are working on the patient at the same time, and the patient is not able to hold pressure, it is generally accepted to bend the patient's arm up temporarily while locating the shop's container and disposing of the collection device. Step 40. Discard collection unit, syringe needle or transfer device. A needle and tube holder must be promptly discarded in a shop's container as a single unit. 
A syringe safety needle, however, may be removed and discarded separately so that the syringe can be attached to a syringe transfer device and tubes filled at this point. A transfer device is similarly similar to an ETS holder but has a prominently attached needle inside. After the device is attached to the syringe, an ETS tube is placed inside it and advanced onto the needle until blood flow into the tube. Additional tubes can be filled as long as there is enough blood left in the syringe. When the transfer is complete, the syringe and transfer device are discarded in a shop's container as a single unit. Step 15. Label tubes. Tubes must be labeled in the presence of the patient immediately after blood collection, never before. And the label must be permanently attached to the tube before leaving an inpatient's bedside or dismissing an outpatient. If you are using a pre-printed computer or barcode label, you will need to write the date, time, or your, your initials and other pertinent information on the label immediately before or after attaching it to the tube. If you do not have a pre-printed label, you will have to hand print the required information on the tube yourself. Any handwritten labeling must be done with a permanent ink pen. Label should include the following information as a minimum. Patient's first and last names, patient's identification number for the inpatient, or date of birth for the outpatient, date and time of collection, phlebotomist initials, pertinent additional information as fasting. Before leaving an inpatient, compare the information on each label tube with the patient's ID band and requisition. Some facilities have the phlebotomist show the label tube to the patient and ask the patient to verify that the correct name is on the tube. Both inpatient and outpatient tubes must then be placed upright in a biohazard specimen bag or other suitable container for transport to the laboratory. Step 16. Observe special handling instructions. Follow applicable special handling requirements. Place specimen that must be cooled, example ammonia, in crushed ice slurry. Put specimens that must be kept at body temperature, example cold agglutinin in a 37 degree heat block or other suitable warming device. Wrap specimens that require protection from light, example bilirubin, in aluminum foil or other light blocking material or place them in a light blocking container. Step 17. Check patient's arm and apply bandage. Examine the venipuncture site to determine if the bleeding has stopped. Bleeding from the vein can continue even though it has stopped at the surface of the skin. If you are certain it has stopped, apply an adhesive bandage or tape and fold a gauze square over the side. If the patient is allergic to adhesive bandages, apply paper tape over a clean folded gauze square. If the patient has sensitive skin or is allergic to the adhesives, place a folded gauze square over the side and wrap gauze around it. Fastening the gauze with paper tape or wrap the side with a self-adhesive gauze-like material such as scuba. Instruct the patient to leave the bandage on for a minimum of 15 minutes after which it should be removed to avoid irritation. Instruct an outpatient not to carry a purse or other heavy object or lift heavy objects with the arm for a minimum of an hour. Sub-18. Dispose of contaminated materials. Dispose of contaminated materials in the proper biohazard containers or according to the facility protocol. Place other materials such as needle caps and wrappers in the trash receptacle. Make sure that you have your tourniquet and that other equipment is returned to the proper place. Step 19. Thank patient, remove gloves and sanitize hands. Thank the patient for his or her cooperation. This is courteous and lets the patient know that the procedure is complete. Remove gloves aseptically as described in Chapter 3. Discard them in the manner required by your institution and sanitize your hands before leaving the area. Step 20. Transport specimen to the lab. 
transport specimens to the laboratory or designated pickup site in a timely fashion. Prompt delivery to the laboratory protects specimen integrity and is typically achieved by personal delivery. Transportation through a pneumatic tube system or arranged pickup by a courier service. The phlebotomist is typically responsible for verifying and documenting collection by computer entry or manual entry in a logbook. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And are you here to do a test? I am here to have blood taken this morning. Okay. Do you have any form of identification yes. or picture? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You come this way. Take a seat. Can you tell me your name, please? My name is Kathleen. Good ma'am. The doctor sent me for a test to say, you have to go and do blood test. What is blood test for? It is hurt? Well, I won't say that it, ha it is a painless procedure, but it is like a hand spite. So you're going to be gentle with me, right? Yes, I will be as gentle as I can be with all patients, including yourself. Okay, thank you. Retire your turn again. Turn the skin cross, one smooth motion in. Release your tourniquet, ask the patient to release their fist. Breathe in for me, in. So, class, we're going to open the So that's thank you for being a very good patient today. And we will send your specimen silver laboratory and uh, we will be getting a call to say that they are ready. Okay, thank you. Don't, don't carry any heavy materials or anything like that at this time because I would like to know that you will be able. Okay? Okay. Thank you. 